So resilience is a widely used word at the moment. We, what, what are the major components of resilience and how does financial inclusion help make economies more resilient? Sure. You know, I, th I think as you said, it's, it's like if you Google it, resilience seems to be the top, you know, top word cloud. And the classic English definition of resilience is an ability to withstand shock. Um, and, you know, you could take it further. Um, like all of you, I, I, I read a lot in media. You, we're at Bloomberg, so we learn a lot about what's going on in the world. And I think post-COVID, one of the biggest things we have learned is, is this idea of immunity. Mm. And I think the world doesn't pay enough attention to economic immunity. Mm. I think if you think about the financial landscape, you know, post-World War, we have always been focused on, you know, you turn on the TV and you always see, you know, what the Fed is doing. So you're, you're sort of pumping economic chemicals into the system. And you're trying to deal with tax policy, fiscal policy. And for us, I think it's important to understand economic immunity. And so resilience is your ability to withstand shock. And with that idea in mind, what we did was say, how can we measure immunity of this world? Yeah. We looked at 42 countries and we said, how do we classify with deep research around three dimensions, which define society for most of us? which is the financial system, because we all live in a financial system, um, the employers we work for directly or indirectly, mm -hmm. and, and the government, because we are all part of governments. And so we came up with this idea, you saw a quick video before, before I came on stage, to really create this idea of global financial inclusion. Yes. And that's the way I think about it, is measuring immunity in society, measuring immunity at the world, across these geographies, and how it could inform us. And from a personal perspective, you know, principal, we have clients in 80 countries, we have staff in 30, you know, I'm an investor at heart. Mm -hmm. And the view I have is, is you have to actively invest in thinking beyond what you read. And it's our way of building this index to understand where the world is going next. Yeah. It allows us, uh, a sort of an invisible view into equality and progress in society. Yeah, I really like that, invest in more than what you read. So as you consider the index, which markets stand out to you, positively or negatively, for how they stack up on financial inclusion? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll probably start with a positive note and then we'll go down. Uh, as I said, 42 countries. and and. You know, you will probably see in the report, and I would encourage all of you to get a copy. We could have it sent out. It's, it's a really good report, but, you know, there are certain countries which you would logically assume do well on financial inclusion. Yeah. But I'll pick two outliers in each categories. So a country that jumped out at me, or two countries that jumped out at me on the positive side is, is Thailand. Mm -hmm. And Thailand, you would not think, would be a country in the top 20 of this index, you are comparing it to G20 economies. And, and if you double click on what Thailand has done, it's ranked 19th, um, there are a couple of things that are happening in an economy like Thailand that most of us don't understand and talk about. One of the measures we look for is confidence. Yeah. You conf how do you measure confidence in small, medium businesses? And how do you measure confidence of people who work for companies? I can tell you, given where I'm sitting today, that measure is low in a country like UK. And so in Thailand, it jumps out is people who work for companies tend to have a high belief system. Yeah. Small to medium employers tend to have high belief system. And to us, it's a leading indicator of how that society is going to progress and how it's going to become a more important space from capital markets. Uh, some of you may not know, for the last 10 years, and we've been an investor and an operator in business in Thailand for a long time. For the last 10 years, the government has been silently working on what's called a national pension scheme. Okay. But they didn't launch it. They've gone through a beta test where they're thinking and learning from all the pension systems of the world of how they provide a benefit to all forms of society. 
not just people who are work for large employers, but small. And that, that's a fact that most of us will not read about. Uh, so Thailand jumps out at us. Uh, Malaysia is another one, uh, close neighbors. Uh, and Malaysia is number 20. It's on the positive side. One of the things that's defined Malaysia is there has been a very active effort to convert government-based enterprises to become private enterprises. Yeah. It's really a purposeful effort, and having society participate in that, but also providing enormous credit growth yeah. for an actual citizen in Malaysia, much faster than you see in G7 nations. And so I would highlight those two outliers on the positive, uh, uh, po positive side. Uh, on, the, on the negative side, something that jumps out to us, and it, it saddens me, is if you look at the bottom 10 rankings, five of those countries are in Latin America. Wow. You look at the bottom five, three of those are in Latin America. Wow. Latin America as a continent has regressed backward when it comes to inclusion and progressiveness on this measure. Wow. And, and we could debate why that is happening, but that is an outlier fact. Um, Chile probably is the highest ranked in that group, but that is sort of barbelling it uh, in, 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 in some, some respect, if you think about it. And I wanted to make sure I got the right number for, 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 for Europe, because there is some interesting facts there as well. Um, so we have what we call the watch list. Yeah. And what surprised me on the watch list were three countries in Europe. Uh, Italy, Spain, I would add France and UK to it. Okay. And Italy, anyone venture to say, guess where Italy would stand in 42 countries? Top 20? 37th. Okay. So the state of affairs, just because you are a developed market, isn't great. Partly because I think in a lot of these economies, there has been an over-reliance on government support and not as much push to create financial education and empowerment at the small to medium business level or at the employer level. Yeah. Anyway, I could go on, but I just wanted to give you some yeah, of those no, facts. You're quite right, and it's, it's an interesting conversation, and it's an ongoing conversation. And here in the UK, there are, there's a continuous push for us also to just think about the importance of financial inclusion as part of our curriculum. Mm -hmm. So you know, It starts from young. So demographics are shifting globally. As we think about work, part-time workers are a growing part of many major economies, but often excluded from comprehensive financial rights. How can we change this? And what is the economic impact if we do not? I think it's a great question, Sonia. Um, I think more than any time in the last 25 years, I think hybrid and part-time work is increasing across the world. Um, you know, post, you know, post through COVID, you saw a big growth in where a lot of citizens decided to either check out of the workforce or decide how they want to participate yeah. on a part-time basis. And while in many of these countries we can't really measure because we don't get good data on full-time versus part-time, um, we probably have the deepest set of insights with small to medium businesses in America. You know, we, we run a lot of, uh, of their uh, financial plans from a retirement perspective, but we are a big benefit provider. And we do some research with small to medium businesses in America. And if you really think about the heart of America is 10, 20, 25 people operations. And there's a lot of part-time workers. You know, in an economy like UK, you could easily see this, is a biggest part of the economy is tourism and retail, yeah. which has a high propensity of part-time workers versus financial services on manufacturing. And if you look at the delta of financial inclusion and security, just on that part-time to full-time, there's a 20 percentage point delta. So if you work full time, your ability to achieve financial security, your level of, of benefit and value your employer provides you is 20 percentage points more than somebody working part time. Mm. So the challenge we have as society is how do we provide the same set of tools for part time workers? Because you can't really have that big a delta in a large society. So to your question, I think it is a problem upon us. Uh, I probably leave you, I think, 
technology and advice is going to be the big part of that change. Sure. A lot of us are going to see over the next next few years, but that's that's something to look for.